Abel stood there baffled at the thought of him and his sister getting married. Looking at his face his father cluelessly asks if he does not want to. Abel freaks out and states that it is not that he does not want to, it is messed up. He remembers his friend's father teasingly asking him about the wedding date. Abel with a sickening feeling, realizes that the weird attitude everyone had all this time was about this. He tries to explain to himself that his understanding of marriage is that it normally binds two families. His father casually states that even he married his younger sister. Abel freaks out and asks if at least it is okay to marry outside the family. His father questions what is wrong with him and tells him that it is said that the stronger the bond the stronger the magic power will be. Abel frantically questions him that he thought he did not care about the magic as he always wanted Abel to hunt with just a bow. His father claims that of course, he cares as it is an important part of the Marin clan's culture. His father inquires at his reaction that he always dotted on Gizzle. Abel defensively states that it was only as an older brother. His father dismissively adds as he gets up that Abel is an adult now and tells him to use this opportunity to become an adult. He pats Abel on his back as he leaves Abel to his misery. Next morning, Abel ponders that knowing this village its customs and his annoying father, they will, without a doubt, start preparing a wedding for them. He desperately thinks that he needs to prepare that at all costs. He pauses getting up from his lying position and wonders if Gizel is aware of this. He was only interested in magic so he neglected learning about the common sense of this world. Gizel has only been hanging around him until now so if he didn't know about this, Gizel is probably the same. Noswell, knowing Gizel is his little sister, tried to make her marry him. Thinking about that, he was probably doing it to spite Abel. Because Shibai knew Abel's attitude towards the situation, he had been approaching Gizel so passionately. He thinks Gizel never even humored him. Abel decides that siblings should never marry each other. No matter how attached Gizel is to him, he is sure she would dislike marrying her big bro. This is where they collude together and make their father and others give up. However, he is startled by Gizel's sudden call. He inhales sharply and hesitantly bids her a good morning. She worriedly asks him if he stayed up all night and says that no matter how well the potions work, she forbids overworking. She not so smoothly avoids the word weak and tells him that it is because his body is delicate. He sweat drops but agrees. She sweetly says that when it is done let her be the first to ride it. He agrees and says that he has finished just a minute ago. He says that he thinks it is good after he changed the original magic or he used from Emic to Lita. Now, it should be able to keep running for a long time. She excitedly asks him if she can do it today. Abel however stops her before she can complete her words. He states that before that he has something that he needs to talk to her about. He puts a hand on his forehead and says that she will probably be surprised but the truth is there's been a lot of talk about her and Abel needing to get married. He continues but is interrupted but his sister's overjoyed squeal. He paused, but his sister continued that his coming-of-age ceremony was just the other day, so she assumed that that would be much further away. To think it would happen this fast, and he would be the one to instigate it. She exclaims with sparkles in her eyes that she is moved. Abel sweats a little as Gizel explains that ten years ago their mother told her about it. Since then, she has dreamed of this moment. She will get to marry her big brother and be able to name herself as such, freely. Abel stands there in utter shock as his sister babbles on about how she understands he is passionately drawn to magic so, she knew that passion would change into a strong passion for his future family. She has intended to wait for him all this time, until the day her big brother's heart is ready, and to think the day will come so soon Gizel is elated. Gizel looks at him suddenly, he hastily makes up an excuse that today he needs to get to the chieftain's place, no matter what, and runs off. She questions him about the test run. He tells her that it is not ready yet and he thinks that it still needs some fine tuning. He exclaims that he is going to check the book storage. She tries to come along but he makes up an excuse that they are also going to talk about some business regarding the incense leaves, and runs off as he worriedly watches him leave. Gizel opens the door to her house and enters. She hears her father suggesting to hold the wedding ceremony in three days. She happily squeals that it is so soon. But she hears her mother say that Abel is not interested in doing this. Dizzle's face falls as soon as she hears those words. Oblivious to this her mother continues that she thought he has quirks however. Her father smiles trying to calm her mother's worries that no matter what he gets swept up in the flow pretty easily. Once the ceremony is over and done with, he will settle down. Abel dully walks into the chieftain's place telling him to pardon his intrusion. The chieftain notices him and states that he would like to consult with him about the incense leaf fields. Abel with an almost dead face tells him that he would like to think about something for a little bit, and requests him to wait for a bit. The chieftain agrees looking at his state. 
Abel sits in the library with his hand on his forehead as he ponders that he never bothered with learning this world's customs due to having learned a set of customs and values from his old world. He bets to himself that he is the only one who has a strange sense of values. He looks in front of him at the design hanging on the wall. In this world, the souls of the dead turn into spirits. Those spirits are then recycled into this world, or so it is believed. That belief is voided due to Abel. He holds the memories from his previous life. In another world, if he informed someone else, he does not know how will they receive it. He clutches his head tighter and ponders that for that reason he has not told anyone and decided to just live his life here. But this drag of a situation came about because he procrastinated in a lot of areas. If he had just accepted everything he wonders if this will all settle normally. But he is more worried about Gizzle, a polar introvert, than himself, a magic nerd shut in. From what Gizzle has said, she has been told all her life that marrying her brother was natural. If it keeps going as it has been, Gizzle will probably have no relationships with anyone other than him. He dreadfully realizes that it is something that in the long run would be a bad thing. The floating totem accidentally drops a scroll from the nearby shelf. It catches Abel's attention and he opens it. He wonders out loud if this is a map of the outside of the village. He curiously looks into it and exclaims that this is it. He will leave the village. He goes through several books thinking that if he disappeared his parents should give up and Gizzle would have to interact with other people. With that settled, he needs to prepare to run away tonight. He runs outside the door with several books in his hands and over flying totems. He calls out to Chieftain that he will be burrowing some books and totems from the book storage. The Chieftain tells him to be sure to return those. Abel hastily agrees but apologizes in his mind as to how he will return those is to be decided later. On the way, he encounters Philo but runs past her telling her that he feels bad but is in a hurry. She plainly congratulates him on his marriage. That makes him pause and he asks her where did she hear about that. She answers that just now she saw his father going around letting everyone know. He curses at his father and wonders if he is trying to entrap him. He sweats and mumbles that he needs to get out of her as soon as possible. She looks at him in question. He quickly shakes her hand and tells her that he is just talking to himself. He thanks her that she has looked out for him a lot. He yells a bye and leaves. She tearily says that he does not have to say it like it is their final farewell. He goes back to his out and yells at them to not disturb him as he plans to delve into some research while climbing the stairs. His father tries to stop him but Abel cleverly tells him that incense leaves are involved and slams the door shut. His father grumbles but does not approach the door. He mutters that if Abel is going to shut himself in, he will just prepare for the ceremony then. Unaware that Gizzle saw this whole interaction with a solemn face, Abel is hastily working on his project when his sister's voice startles him as she asks if he wants her to bring something to eat. He quickly yells that it is fine and he has settled that at the chieftain's place. He tells her that he was told to do something time-sensitive so he is in a rush. She calls out to him again but he tells her that he wishes to focus. But Gizzle continues regardless telling him to be sure not to collapse from exhaustion midway as he has a delicate body. He apologizes for worrying her as she again tells him not to push himself. He claims that he will be careful. He sighs in relief when he feels that she has left. At night he leaves a note, writing that he will be leaving until he hears news that Gizzle has married, or he marries someone. Until then, goodbye. He is ready to leave as his three totems carry his luggage and he tells his spell to carry him. He softly opens the door to avoid making much noise. Years ago he would sneak out a lot like this, and he bets that this will be the last time. He brings out his four-wheeler, puts his luggage into it, and styles in it as well. He spells initiating the start up. It starts going into the forest, he lies in it and thinks that Gizzle will probably be angry, and wonders if he will be allowed to come back. People of the Marin clan, as a general rule, are forbidden from leaving the village unless they get permission to leave from the chieftain. He does not know what they will do to those who break the rules but he had heard that those who leave the village will, without a doubt, regret it or so has been passed down. He thinks that someday when Gizzle gets a family, he would like to at least watch over her from afar. He feels tears swelling up as he sobs and falls asleep. He lets out a yawn and gets up holding the map. He wonders where he is now. At this speed, he should be coming up on a lake. He thinks Lamarn is much further off. The city of Lamarn apparently brings in a ton of people for its bustling trading market. With a bustling trading market, all kinds of information must also be passed around. He thinks that there are a bunch of foreign items, most certainly magic tools one can't find in the village hopefully. He gleefully thinks about how exciting all this is, but suddenly his totem truck sand stops working, and smoke starts to come out of it. 
At home, his father yells out his name and lashes that he left without even leaving behind a letter. Gizel calms him down by telling him that it might be because he intends to return soon. He might have gone to do some tests on his new totem. Her father looks at her as she continues with a smile that if he is not back by sunset they should ask Chieftain to make a search party. Her father tries to counter but she says that she believes that it will be okay. The letter makes a scrunch sound as she crushes it in her grip hidden from her father's view. She adds that she has faith in her big brother. Abel is still struggling with his broken totem truck. He kneels beside his totem truck and ponders that the part he is sure that he changed to Lita is now emicked. There are traces of it being forcibly changed. He wonders who would have done that. He remembers having the conversation about this with Gizel and their conversion the day before. He realizes that he only talked to Gizel about the problem with the ore. Making it to Lamarn from here would be impossible for him and ponders that the distance to the village is nearer, but by the time he reaches there he would probably be on the verge of death, but it is not a distance he can't walk. He wonders why would she use such a roundabout way to stop him if his midnight escape with the truck was seen through. There must have been a better option. He dreadfully concluded that the reason why she didn't use a different way ID to make him break the rule. He realizes that those with a criminal record won't be able to easily escape a second time. In order to tie him down in the village his father will most likely force him to marry Gizel. He does not want to think that Gizel planned his far but at this rate if he runs back home, he will probably lose his will to leave the village again. He hates the idea of being forced to marry even more. He has nothing else to learn from that place. Further down this road lies things he does not know yet. A world of magic may be awaiting for him. He tears up at the thought of letting his life of wondrous magic end in that village. A female voice catches his attention and he turns around to find a girl standing over a catching asking him what is wrong. Even in his miserable state, Abel recognizes that it is a horse-drawn carriage. He perks up, picks up his luggage and asks where they are heading with that carriage. The boy who is driving the carriage answers that they are grading to Lamar. Hearing this Abel tears up again and yells that his life has been saved. He was allowed to ride in the baggage area of the carriage. He will not be returning to the village yet. The boys conclude out loud that his hair and eyes make him a part of the Marin clan and asks him what he is doing all the way out here. Abel scratched the back of his head and stated that he could not see eye to eye so he ran away. The girl happily adds that he is just like Maya. She says that James San came to Maya's village to do some peddling so Maya cried till he brought her with him. Abel says that he thought they were a traveling couple. James explains that he met her just a week ago. Abel questioned if her reasoning was also because of customs she couldn't get used to. She partially agrees and explains that she is from the Doom clan. Apparently, not having a magical crystal on her forehead is problematic. Abel is pretty sure they have a few distinct traits, two horns, and embedded in their forehead is a crystal, or there should be. She clears the hair from her forehead revealing it to be missing the embedded crystal as she continues that while Maya's mother was pregnant, she fell. That was probably when Maya's crystal peeled off. Abel exclaims that it can be peeled off from something like that. She offhandedly adds that pretty easily to like escape. Once it comes off, it won't grow back. So, no one takes theirs off. Since Maya was born, she never had one. So, she was often scorned as a no stone. He aggressively says that her mother also scorned her. She says that she yelled at her that she gave birth to her like this. Abel notices that her tone is kind of indifferent, though it seems that she has been through a lot. She happily continues that because of that she left and brought this along. She showed him a bag that made a jingle noise when she pulled it out. He questions what that is. She answers that it is her mother's secret savings, and he questions if taking that was okay. She answers without feeling an ounce of guilt that not even this much will make up for all she did to Maya. She adds that these are those reparations things. She cheerfully says that from now on Maya will be joyfully experiencing the wide wide world with James. James only laughs when he hears this. He is about to answer when Abel notices something and asks I those are magic beasts. James looks back and exclaims that those are Garm. He increases the speed of the carriage and Abel questions if they are a variant of hounds. Magic beasts are a variant class of beasts that are born from the convergence of magic power in the right circumstances. They appear suddenly so predicting their creation is difficult. The chances of encountering them are low, but when traveling, it is a natural disaster one must be careful of. Maya frantically yells for James to speed up. But Abel calmly says that the village chieftain told him if he sees a beast with an assigned hazard rank of D or higher near town. It is his duty to report it. He adds that around the village, one would only see greater bears. He notices Maya frantically yelling and asks if she is bad with dogs, and starts his tale that back at home they have this good boy. His name is Loops. James, however, grimly says to never mind that as they have to get out of here. 
He yells at him to throw out all the luggage in the cart, and if they are lucky it will catch their interests. Abel hesitates saying that it is such a waste. Maya frantically yells that they are already so close. That is when James yells that Abel is from the Marin clan and asks if he can use his magic. Abel answers that he can use a modest amount. James orders him to use as much as he can to try and freak out the Garm. Abel says just enough to freak them out, they will be a problem for other travelers if they do not exterminate or capture them. James yells that anything is fine but he has to hurry. Abel pulls out his wand and chants earth, form, shape and a giant pillar in the shape of a totem doll appears from the ground up. He still cluelessly turns around and asks James if this is enough. Both James and May are shocked and exclaim that the Marin clan people are crazy. They camp at night and travel past the rivers as they continue their journey. James smiles as he says that he can see it now and states that this is Lamart. Abel and Maya both look at the city gate in awe. They cross the city gate. Maya desperately asks why they need to split up here. James scratches the back of his head and says that he was going to tell her earlier. Abel supports his decision and says that it can't be helped as both of them could not be useful to the business of a peddler. He calmly thanks James for giving him a ride and shakes his hand as James thanks him as well that if he was not there, they would have been in trouble. Maya sees her chances and adds that this is right as she pulls out her bag full of her mother's secret fortunes and says that with this she will buy all of James' wheat then he will have nothing to do. Abel asks what she is going to do with it afterward. She tears up as James apologizes to her but she sharply turns to Abel and says that Abel will not leave her. Seeing her this desperate for the answer he says that he does not have anything else planned. Maya cleverly adds that he has not taught her the advanced methods of totem engraving yet. She exclaims that she really wants to hear more about the magical stuff. Seeing this Abel also perks up and asks if she took that much of a liking to it. He tries to appear smart and says that he also does not know anyone here, so having a companion really helps. James smiles at the scene remembering that Maya fell asleep mid-journey when Abel was babbling on about his magic stuff, but he does not say anything. She happily says that she will be counting on him. She adds that if there is anything he wants she will buy it for him. Abel carefully tells her that she should keep that as a saving, and wonders if she is okay. The roam around the city, Abel comments that is expected of a city. It is completely different from a village. He looks at something and immediately perks up. Magic alchemy tool shop. He looks at the bark of a tree which is similar to that of a totem doll before carving. A witch appears from inside of the shop, praising the keen eyes of her customers. She had that sitting there for a while, but he was the only one to be interested in it before anything else. Maya cluelessly questions if it is a tree trunk. The witch gently explains that it is not a tree trunk, it is a branch from a world tree. Abel exclaims that he knew it. Near the center of a giant forest called the Forest of Magic, there lies a giant tree. Due to the world tree possessing magic power, the area around the word tree has many ferocious magic beasts. It was bought back five years ago by a famous four-person party that entered the Forest of Magic to exterminate magic beasts. However, only one person survived. The witch continues that after losing all their equipment, that person used an illusion on the magic beasts and ran away almost completely naked, then sold the branch for a heavy price. Maya comments that it is an object with quite a history. Abel looks at it intently amazed at the flow of magic energy. It has a barrier but the energy is still spilling out. He gleefully says that if a totem is made out of this, it would be crazy. The witch questions what is a totem. After explaining Maya is asleep on the nearby chair and the witch is smiling. She says that there are that kind of magic tools in his homeland. She puts a bottle in front of him and asks what about something like this. He exclaims in shock that it is a unicorn's blood. She explains that there was a magic beast disaster, a monster panic, containing huge quantities of unicorns. And at first, there was a huge fuss over it. Monster panic is a natural disaster where magic beasts of the same species appear in large numbers. There are various theories as to their origins, but details about them remain unclear. He exclaims that it was of assigned crypto-class unicorns and mutters that cities are no joke. She says would it not be useful to use it as a paint ingredient. He agrees that if he had this and the world tree, he could make an amazing one without a doubt. The witch asks how does 2.100 G sound for both the branch and the blood. Abel pauses as he hears the prize. Thinking about it he is pretty broke now. Commonly ownership of certain drugs is banned, like in the Dinlark kingdom which Lamarn belongs to and so all the incense leaves he brought are useless. He remembers trying to sell it to James who guiltily refused to buy it, 
He clenches his fists thinking that if he had real money if he was home he could have sold them very easily. Naya puts her bag of fortune down and asks if this will be enough. The witch perks up and says that with this they will have a change to spare. She suggests if they will like, changing all these here. Naya exclaims that it will save her a lot of trouble. Abel tries to stop her but she claims that she will buy it for him since he wants it that much. He hesitantly says that he cannot accept her putting out that large sum of money without even batting an eye. The witch sighs in relief that after all this time she has finally found someone to buy this off of her. She says that she will make it two million fifty thousand. Maya exclaims a kind bargain, but Abel exclaims that it does not even count as a deal. Maya gleefully tells him that she does not mind. The witch also adds that does not think he will come across something as extraordinary as this world tree very often. Maya jumps on the futon exclaiming how soft it is. Abel sits in the corner of the room regretfully thinking that he also made her cover up his boarding fees. The unicorn blood and the world tree branch sparkled beside him. But he gets serious and remembers the witch's words she won't know till she sees the completed product. But she thinks if he can increase that world tree's value, she will pay double or more than what she sold it for. He grins thinking that this is just an investment. As Maya jumps on the bed, he will make a masterpiece settle his debt with it and gain a fortune, two birds with one stone. He pulls out his knife and his eyes sparkle. He thinks that with this he will make the world's best totem, and he has got to repay Maya. He soon finishes making the totem and it floats in the air. Abel sparkles as he exclaims that it is a top quality masterpiece, and if he can control this he can do almost anything. He is hit by a sudden wave of dizziness as he staggers and claims that it must be because he stayed up all night. Maya wakes up at the sound of something hitting the ground she gets up to find Abel unconscious on the ground. He slowly opens his eyes and realizes that he is in his house's small storage house. He comes back that his truck broke down midway while heading towards Lamarn. He tries to move but dreadfully realizes that he is bound to both his fret and hands behind his back and he is unable to speak thanks to the cloth covering his mouth. The door opens and Gizzle steps in holding a tray in her hand. She gently says that he woke up. She apologizes for keeping him here and states that she restrained him so he could not do something so reckless again. She releases the cloth around his mouth, he exhales loudly. She gently requests him to not act in such a dangerous manner again. He coughs almost tearing up, and realizes that she is confusing his escape with the truck with an experiment. He sees her blowing on the soup she brought him. He decides that could not be possible and his gaze quickly turns into a glare. He left behind a letter, and she had to be the only other person who could have tempered with the truck. She says that his stomach must be empty and tells him to eat as she has made it herself. He looks at the soup in distaste. In the Marin clan, there is a strong idea that meals are something the wife makes. He dreadfully realizes that if he eats this he is sure that he will not be able to turn back. He bows and apologizes that he ran away without a word. At the time he could not think of anything else. He continues that he is unlike a normal member of the Marin clan. His thought process is fundamentally different, and his reason may be hard to believe. He thought that one day he would tell her. They sit there in silence before she speaks up, she says that she understands, and requests him to at least drink some water, as it is for the sake of his own body. He gladly drinks up the offered drink when she continues that she understands that her brother is just confused about all that has been going on. His eyes widen as she apologizes before stabbing him in the knees. He screams in pain as Gizzle starts to heal the wound she has just made. He pants heavily before he gets stabbed again tears swell up in his eyes as he realizes that he can't move his tongue, concluding his doubt on the water he just drank. Gizzle smiles at her big brother and says that it is okay even if he cannot walk any longer. She will always be by his side to take care of him. The cycle repeats several times and he screams again and again. If this keeps up he will really lose the use of his leg. He tries to think of some sort of magic to resist. He suddenly opens his eyes and sees a worried Maya on top of him. She exclaims that he finally woke up. She frantically asks if the magicians have the habit of sleep talking and chanting spells. He looks in front of him there are several magic circles open and a giant one in the middle. He realizes that he has made this and sits up on the bed. He thinks that the magic circle is amazing. One could theoretically destroy anything with this. He smiles deviously saying that his own talent is frightening. She yells at him to put it away as it is scaring her. He apologizes saying that he had a really bad dream, and it seems he made it unconsciously. He silently thinks that it is dangerous that he almost erased the entire region. She asks what kind of dream he had. He opens his mouth to answer but shivers and says that he can't seem to remember or rather he does not want to remember. He folds his hands and flops on the bed. Maya claims that it must be a scary dream before she presses a hand to his forehead checking for a fever. She says that his fever came down. 
he questions how long he was asleep, and she casually answers that one and a half days, and he would not wake up so Maya was very flustered. He thanks her for looking out for him. She happily says that she was useful. He states that he better show his appreciation and looks at the totem in front of him. He picks it up and exclaims that if he sells this, he will instantly get a large amount of money. He gazes at the totem he has carved and cries a bucket. Maya sees him falling apart emotionally and pitifully asks if he does not want to sell it. He silently nods in answer. She says it is all right as that world tree is something Maya gave to Abel. He tells her that even if she says that, even the board fees, and points out the problem if this continues. She says that the Adventurer Support Center is a place where one can go to exchange hunted magic beasts for money or so Maya heard from the inn's people. She says that Abel is strong so it should be perfect for him. He wonders if they have such an organization and concludes that this is how they protect the town from the magic beasts. They decided to check it out tomorrow. Marin Village The events after Abel had boarded James's horse-drawn carriage to head to Lamart. The village chieftain dispatched a search team that found Abel's truck. Knowing where Abel was from the engravings he wrote on the truck was enough for the team to call off the search for the time being. Gizzle thought Abel would have to return, but contrary to her belief, he has not. Now more than ever, Gizzle has been spending her days like a shut-in. She sat in Abel's room which was filled with totems with a totem on her lap. Her parents were standing outside that room. His father tried to approach her but her mother shook her head. Her father gazed at her and cried seeing her in such a low spirit. Gizzle ruefully gazes at the totem doll. She talks to it like it is Abel himself. It asks why is he not returning, and says that it is not like she is mad or anything. She says this while stabbing her totem doll on her lap. She mercilessly stabbed it multiple times. Her father shivers at the sight of her behaving like this. Unknown to them a black misty cloud floats outside her windows and spells that it has found a way as it gazes at Gizzle. Adventurous support center. Abel asks Maya if she can use magic as well. She scratches her cheeks and answers that if they are talking about enough to fight a magic beast kind, she will try to use magic but those around her don't like it. She tapped her forehead which was missing the embedded crystal. He makes a note to not ask her about her clan. They are called on the line. He hesitantly says that they came from the countryside and so he asks her to explain what the organization does. The attendant understands and starts explaining everything. A while later has his card in his hands. On it were his adventurer credentials and registered name is Mount Mountain. Maya asks why did he register under that name. He says that because it does not seem like a problem and says that he also did it on impulse. The main goals of the Adventurer Support Center are Magic Beast Extermination, Adventure Support, and Discovering Talent. Magic Beast Extermination is their most prominent goal. To achieve this just about every city will have an Adventurer Support Center set up. In order to receive support, one just needs this Adventure Credential card. An Adventurer's deeds are managed by the organization. They have a system where achieving merit-worthy deed will increase their ranks. Abel thinks that it would be rather troubling to be tied down, so he does not want to raise his rank. He smiles as he says that his benefactor's name is Mount Mountain. Maya questions him calling it a benefactor. He answers that it saved him when magic beasts ganged up on him before. She exclaims that there are magic beasts that could gang up on Abel. He continues that if things kept going as they were, he would have died in the blink of an eye. He reduced all the magic beasts around him to ashes, then completely healed Abel when he was on the edge of death. He gleefully thinks that he is talking about an online game, and slyly smiles to himself. And it is a memory from the previous world. Maya gazes at his card in awe exclaiming that everyone in the Marin clan is strong. Now that they have finished registering, they decide to settle for the plan after this. Abel wonders out loud where should they hunt first. There was a loud argument going on beside them that caught their attention. A guild mate was telling his member whose name is Mazen that they don't see eye to eye. Mazen quickly apologizes saying that he went too far. He requests the other to make up and reset their conversation. Another comrade a girl stands and exclaims that if Teed is going to leave then so will she. She confesses her love to him and requests him to let her go with him. He accepts her confession claiming that he also loves her. Mazen awkwardly tries to butt in and claims that he loves both of them. Abel looks at the scene unbothered to react while Maya watches this with sparkles in her eyes. They watch the recently made couple leave the filled Mazen behind who was on his knees now. Maya exclaims how passionate it is as she hopes those two become a happy couple. Abel silently judges that this is where she was paying attention to. He tells her to not look too much and that it is better to not get involved. But it was too late as Mazen looked directly at their table. He sees his chances and calls them out. He goes straight to the point that earlier they were worrying about where to go hunting. 
and asks if they were magicians. He says that he really needs magician companions. He says that he is a party leader and claims that he just chased out some useless members. He suggests they join him instead. However, Abel is quick to dodge the bullet as he states that he is good and practically picks May up when she does not move. Mason steps in his way and says that if they stick with him he will cover their travel expenses, and states that he also has info on a very valuable hunting spot. They pause and look at each other. They are in a horse-drawn carriage when Abel questions him about his very valuable hunting spot. He says that hunting in the forest seems more efficient. Mason explains that lately, it seems that a number of barriers have been lifted. There was an investigation in those ruins that got delayed, due to magic beasts entering the ruins after the barriers opened. He confidently states that this is where they skillfully delve into the ruins and claim its treasure. Zeshem Ruins Elves live in the sky country of Ulfheim, and don't descend of their own volition. The elves one can see on the ground are either the ones who committed a crime and were banished from the sky country of Ulfheim, or the descendants of those criminals. The elf clan is a race with a life expectancy of around 500 years, proficient at magics. Around 20,000 years ago, several hundred elves were driven out due to religious conflicts. The elves on the ground were persecuted by the Norks clan. To resist their oppressors they built a fortress. Norks clan is a race known for having no peculiar characteristics. Eventually, the Norks clan came to accept the elves, so the elves sealed their fortress and left. Now all that is left are these Zeshem ruins. Abel questions if the treasure is the elves' legendary secret treasure the Arrow of the God. Mazen agrees and says that the more likely one that should be there is the magic stone that maintained the barriers and protected the ruins. That alone should hold quite a significant value. He adds that to the cakewalk of the magic beasts in the ruins that they will hunt, basically two birds with one stone. He says that there is nothing to worry about. Maya looks at him as he praises himself saying that he is an almost E-rank adventurer, and this party's leader. Himea whispers to Abel and asks when was that decided. He says that it is fine that way since Mazen is putting out money, and thinks to himself that he does not care. They reach the Zeshem ruins and Mazen curses loudly and says that even though the ruins were right there, he curses the investigation teams that just because they have some lord backing them up does not mean they can be arrogant. The three of them lit the campfire and sat around it as Mazen grumbled about the fortune. Maya says that they were rather unapproachable as she remembers the conversation they had. The guards had told them that the outsiders were not allowed and ordered them to leave the place. Abel points out that this must be why the information has yet to reach the support center. He states that a lord who has the power to keep a secret trove to themselves would never hand it over to someone else. Putting that aside Abel says that they came all this way, they should wait till the sun comes up. If they can see the ruins from afar he will probably be satisfied. Maya immediately agrees. Mazen argues and asks if they intend to give up. Abel bluntly affirms him and tells him that it is impossible as they have that place guarded too tightly. Mazen tries to encourage them that adventure and trouble come hand in hand, and states if they wait with fierce patience they will show an opening. However, his little speech was interrupted by a loud screech which puts them all on guard. Maya shrieks and Abel wonders out loud if it is a magic beast. Mazen moves to take his sword claiming it to be a perfect timing. He says that he was getting antsy being forced to sit around. He will show them what an E-rank adventurer's sword skills can do. He yells for the inferior ranked magic beat to come at him however it wants. Abel unimpressed tells him to settle down as there is no point in him exposing their position. Giant ape-like beasts appear from the forest. Mazen slashes his sword at him claiming that is easy. The beast, however, gets even more angry and calls his friends. And several other beasts emerge from the forest as well. Abel curses and looks at Mazen, who throws his sword away, and sprints at full speed with several beasts chasing after him. He yells at them that while he is distracting them they should run. Maya silently asks what about the sword skills. Abel mutters about the Joe Star technique passed down through generations. Mazen falls on the way and screams as he turns around to see the beasts on top of him. Abel quietly pulls out his sword saying that it is good that he is motivated. He spells fire to burn to nothing and the heads of the beasts burn to ashes. He asks Mazen if he is alright, but he freaks out and looks at Abel's wand. He calmly thanks Abel for saving him. He scratches the back of his head and sheepishly asks if he wants the leader position. Abel easily refused as he could not care less. An elderly looking elf gazes at them, with a book in his hand, and identifies Abel with his white hair, and also red eyes, and peculiar magic circles. He concludes that the kid must be from the Marin clan. The elf asks if he is from the Marin clan. Abel grasps that it is an elf. Mazen questions him if he knows who is the old man. The old elf continues as he gazes at the staff Abel is holding and says that it is designed to enhance magic control, 
and draw in spirits. He questions why it is outside of the theory. Abel is amazed that he could tell that just by looking. He answers that he is using it specifically as an experiment. He holds his wand in front of him and continues that he felt that there was no need to include a magic amplifying effect. The old elf muses that Abel seems rather confident, as his guards approach him calling him Abel Hade Sama. They humbly request him to return to them. He points rudely at Abel and his friends, but Abel Hade stops him by holding a hand between them. The old eld introduces himself that he is Abel Hade of the elf race. He tells them that in order to research his people's history, he is investigating these ruins. He says that if Abel helps him with his research, he shall allow him to accompany him and if he produces results, he will be sure to negotiate with the Lord about a reward. Mazin immediately irks up at the sound of the reward. His guards try to stop him but he counters that this magician appears to be more useful than that Wagner. He turns to Abel and questions what will he do addressing him as the magician of the Marin. Mazin and Maya both look at Abel. The next day, Abel questions if the one who broke the barriers was Abel Hade. Abel Hade states that he corrects that after so many years of investigating, he was finally able to release the outer barriers. However, researching alone only yielded so much fruit. That is why he sought the regional lord's cooperation. He leads them inside the ruins with a lamp in his hands and several of his men following them, and practically surrounding them. Abel concludes that he was originally working independently, and then the lord later got involved. He knocks on the walls of the ruin. He says that these ruins are made out of strange ore. Abel had believed it to be alchemy from the sky country, and not from the ground. Alchemy is a branch of magic, the combined use of magical knowledge and medicinal tools. Abel asks if this ore is a hint to spreading light on the seals here. Abel Hade glares at him and states that he has no intention of playing along with any of your independent interests. He smirks and tells him not to forget who is employing him. Abel staggers at his gaze and curses that Abel Hade realizes that he was just saying stuff so he could examine the ore further. Abel Hade asks if he was trying to trick him with such a misleading question. Abel exclaims that he had no such intentions. Abel Hade says that his guard is tight. The guard whispers to him that this is the first time he has seen Abel Hade making a face like that. He says that he is quite a moody one, and he won't even give them the time of the day. The guard tells him that yesterday he was so peeved that they almost got kicked out. The voice behind him catches Abel's attention as a man holding a cane comes forward saying that he can't follow the great elf's ideas. He scorns Abel and says that Abel Hade has bright a brat from who knows where. All that elf does is wander around without even touching the magic formulas. He says that there is no wonder there is no progress. He mutters that being made to follow him around is wearing him out. The snarls that to dissolve this kind of seal, it is important to check many times and steadily make progress. Maya says that he makes her feel gross. Abel wonders what is up with this guy. Abel answers that there is no need to check magic formulas on the walls. Maya gazes at him as he answers the questions. He points at the wall and says that this is for preserving the quality of seals around the area. For that reason analyzing this would not help to dissolve any barriers. There must be a large magical formula that acts as a base somewhere. However, the man yells at him for assuming that and tells him to not say such careless things. Abel calmly answers that from what he has seen so far the barrier seals are the same as a Pig clan barrier and just the surface looks different. The man exclaims in shock as Abel Hade praises Abel saying that it is good that he took notice of that and states that the man is a magician the Lord deployed but he is an interior norks that just can't keep up. The man shakes, enraged by the words of the elf. Abel Hade says that he was right to bring Abel here. Abel gives him a quiet thanks and notices that the man is glaring daggers at him like crazy. Room of the Griffin Statue Abel Hade believes that the statue's purpose is to amplify the seal's core. He tells Abel that he can call this the magic formula's heart. Abel exclaims that it is neat. He gets closer to the magic circles as if to touch them. He thinks if he can break through this, one can go further in. He says that this is a multi-frame barrier. Multi-frame barrier is made of multiple barriers arranged like a puzzle. He questions if this is a four-layered one and he heard that two-layered practically does not exist. Abel Hade explains that this here is a fake, for one of them. He cannot find how it interacts with the others and concludes that it has to be a three-layered seal. He shows Abel all the notes from the investigation. Abel exclaims that this is amazing and asks about the abbreviated formula. Maya rubs her eyes muttering that she is sleepy and Mazin claims that he does not understand a word they are saying. Abel agrees that this is rather troublesome as he touches the magic circle on the wall. He states that the frontal attack to remove it is excessive. He suggests to not destroy it with magic. Abel Hade says what a trivial joke. As magic that could directly break this statue would require a colossal amount of magic power. 
Abel counters that using sheer power would probably not be that much work. Abelhade states that his daringness is heartwarming and says that even if that were possible, he intends to keep these ruins fully intact. Abel chides himself that it should have been obvious as destroying stuff recklessly would probably lower the reward, but realizes that this is an elaborate seal and wonders what is beyond it. He presumes that it must have been some amazing treasure. The guards yell about the goblins and suddenly they are surrounded by a ton of goblin army. Abel questions what is up with them and Abel hate answers that they must have hidden in the forest waiting for the right time to attack them. Mazen says that it would have been fine if it was one versus one but this is a huge amount. Another guard curses and another one yells that they will make a path and tells the other to use that opening. However, that man with glasses argues that they are just telling him to run away alone and asks who will be his escort. Abel suspiciously asks how did this guy become a lord's magician. Abelhaid tells them to move and flicks his finger stepping forward. He says that he will make them regret ever coming to this place. He puts his hand forward and chants right of light. Two rings trap a goblin and throw it in the mess. Abelhaid turns to his companions and tells them to follow his lead, and says that if they cut their numbers in half they should run. The guards shout in agreement. Abel exclaims that Abelhaid is so dependable that he will not even get a chance to show off. The man with the glass scorns and Maya glares at him. Abel yells at them to capture three hobgoblins alive. Mazen exclaims at what he was just told. Abel yells that he might be able to use them to dissolve the seal. Abelhade takes a note of it and says just three. He casts his spell a trifling task. Twenty minutes later the soldiers are panting hard. One guard claims that he does not want to see another goblin for a while. Another says that hobgoblins look like humans. He really does not wish to kill them. Abelhade asks Abel if this will be fine. Abel thanks him and says that he has paralyzed them with magic and they won't move for about 92 days. Maya shrieks and asks what he plans to use them for. He states that in order to dissolve this seal, the magic power of a particular magic beast is required. He says that it will take time in order to pinpoint the exact beast, especially for a 2,000-year-old seal. There is even a chance the magic beast is now extinct. Therefore he thought he could convert these guys' magic power as a substitute. Inside of every organism, there is an organ that produces magic power, using that as a focus to rewrite the goblin's biology with magic, then turn the magic power the goblins produce into the organism's magic that the statue requires. Boa magic if all the other seals are the same this should take care of them at once. Abelhade sweats and states that it does not seem impossible. He had only reached the conclusion that a magical beast's magic was required, but he did not consider his idea. He praises Abel saying that he is a more capable magician than he had thought. Abel says that his idea is all thanks to Abelhade's notes. He adds that it is not for sure that this will succeed. First, they need to change the hobgoblin's organic makeup to do that they need to procure some magic stones. Magic stones OS a congealed cluster of infinitesimal spirits and magic that is petrified. It can do things like collect magic power, although it is different from magic ore. Abelhade states that he has some of the highest qualities. He orders one of his men to bring it. Abel freaks out as soon as he lays his eyes on the magic stone questioning if this is a king-grade magic stone. They state that without reserve, in order to aid Abelhade's research and investigation of the ruins, they pulled together all of these stones. He continues that all of these were given by the Lord. Abel practically sparkles at the sight of the magic stones and does not notice Abelhade looking at him intently. He viciously smiles and states that with all these he feels like they can't fail. Maya says that she was not following what he just said but carefully asks if he is not going to do something crazy. He tells her that if she can't handle Gore she should look away. She shrieks at what he has done and exclaims that it is gross. Abel does not pay her any attention and says that he feels like he can see the flow of magic. He thinks he senses a bit of bird type. The soldiers look at him terrified of his deeds. Mazen covers his mouth so he does not puke. The guards bluntly state that he is a demon. Another one claims that magicians are dangerous. They are starting to feel pity for the goblins. Hearing this Abel accuses them in his mind that they were just slaughtering those goblins earlier. He attaches the goblins to the sealed wall and states that this should do it, and leaves the rest to Abelhade who agrees and starts chanting assimilate. The goblins shake as the magic circles get bigger. One of the guards mutters that the goblins are shaking like crazy. He questions if they are alright as there is a weird miasma floating around. Abel shouts Gaburu, Gabuko, and Gabutu and tells them to not die on him as he encourages them. Mazen sickly realizes that he gave them names. A barrier is released as Abel exclaims that it is gone. The guards happily think that they can finally delve deeper and exclaim that this is a historic moment. Maya notices that something is shaking. Abelhade warns them to get away from the statue. 
a loud threatening voice curses the elves. It says that they did well to seal a king like himself for 2,000 years. Abel and others cover themselves as the voice scratches that every last one of them will be sacrificed to it. Abel screams for his Gabiru, Gabuko, and Gabutu and runs to approach them but is held back by Maya who is holding onto his tunic yelling that it would be dangerous. He cries that after the seal was dissolved he planned to make them his pets. She grows silent at this. Abelhaid says that this is the last guardian of these ruins. He orders everyone to not stand in front of him and yells to take advantage of their numbers and surround him. He chats light mind. It does not affect the giant eagle as it scratches and gets away attacking another guard. The guards back off and stagger at this and Abelhade orders Abel to attack his wings. Abel furiously glares at the eagle and asks how dare he do that to Gabu brothers. He chants wind shape of blade. The eagle evades his attack and calls him foolish. Abel notices the spirit knees. It turns to Abel scorning that he thinks using wind magic against him will yield results. He curses realizing that a few magic beasts and high-class demons can understand spirit knees. In order for a magic beast that can understand spirites to be born, they must be strongly influenced by spirits. The sprites that served as the catalyst gave the creature strong resistance to the magic. Griffins are the magic beasts that closely resemble wind attribute spirits. So even if he fires off wind magic at it, the griffin looks at him and says that he is foolish to make light of him. However, in a millisecond one of his wings is cut off. It shrieks and falls to the ground. Even Abel is watching dumbfounded at this. The guards take their chance and yell for everyone to charge. Abel slowly mutters that it was a lot less imposing than he had thought. Maya comments that she thought Abel was quite strong. They don't notice Abelhade gazing at him from a little distance. Abelhade casts for the door to open. Abel comments that it would seem the ruin's closed window has opened. The man with glasses arrogantly claims that just ahead is the arrow of God and other famed treasures. He happily takes the lead. Abel glares at him because he has not even done anything. However, the man pauses when he hears something. The guards ask what that sound is and exclaim as they see Sufi. The bunch of demon rats with a crystal embedded in their forehead are running towards them. Maya shrieks yelling at the Gaiano rats. Abel hurriedly questions if they came after the smell of all the magic beasts they defeated. Abelhade clicks his tongue muttering that the low-class magic bests just come one after another. Mazen sees his chances and jumps with his sword telling them to leave this to his sword skills. Abel silently says that when he notices the opponents are weak he gets very excited. Maya cries and hides behind Abel. Thirty minutes later the guards mutter that first goblins, then a griffon, then Sufi. This is the first time they have fought so many magic beasts. The others agree before Abelhade commands them to stand up and tells them that they are moving forward. A guard tries to explain that everyone is tired from all the consecutive battles and it would be best to turn in for today. Abelhade aggressively calls them weaklings. Abel offhandedly comes walking in and claims that he agrees with them. He thinks that the hallway the goblins and Sufis attacked should be checked and shut. That way they can explore undisturbed. He states that it would honestly be tough for him to carry on. Abelhade agrees saying that even he would be running you of magic power and struggling after fighting a griffon. Abel muses that he will let him know that the magic power is fine. However, it is his stamina. She staggers and he mutters that all day they have done nothing but walk around after all. Abel hate announces for them to rest for a short while. Tomorrow once again they resume the investigation. Abel is sitting near the fire reading Abel Hade's notes. Abel hate approaches him and asks if it is all right for him to not sleep. Abel says that he just took a nap and he also drank a homemade potion. He hands Abel hate a bottle of his potion. He says that this helps get rid of sleepiness and increases your concentration. Abelhade gazes at the bottle moment before returning it to Abel. He informs him that it would be best for him not to show this round in public. He tells Abel that brewing peculiar medicinal herbs is normally forbidden in any country. Abel exclaims that but Abelhade continues that, and, in order to dissolve the barrier, the biomagic he used, he says that normally one needs a country's permission to use it comments that Abel's homeland was rather extraordinary. Abel makes a face at that and thinks that there were such hindering laws outside the village. When he entered the town, he did not have any luggage to be searched so he didn't really pay it much attention. Abelhade says that he will be sure to cover for him by taking responsibility. He tells Abel that after Griffon's rampage, he should clean up any proof of his involvement. He hesitantly thanks Abelhade for his kindness. Abelhade suddenly tells him that he is grateful for all he has done. He explains that by overlooking one thing in his analysis he let this drag on for many long years. He says that he has no descendants to entrust his life goals to. Abel asks when did he start investing in Zeshem Ruins. Zeshem Ruins answers that it has been about 300 years since he was born. 
and he has been at this since he can remember. Abel had thought that he was around 400 years old. But it is hard to tell just by looks. Abel Hade asks him what made him get together with a group like them. Abel Hade says that the young girl and the swordsman, with his capabilities, isn't dragging along those folks a nuisance. Abel sweat drops as he hears Abel Hade call them useless folks. He can't deny that on the adventuring front, he silently thinks that on the expenses front, he is completely dependent on them. He remembers that Mazin is his travel expense benefactor and Maya is his totem material expense benefactor. He quietly thinks that one could that there is a give and take relationship. He hesitantly answers to Abelhaid that he just left his village so having companions makes him feel more confident. He tells him that there are many reasons why he is in this situation. Abelhaid gets up and tells him to rest now as tomorrow. They will progress deeper into the ruins anew. Abel absent-mindedly bid him a good night. He suddenly states that he expects great things from Abel. Abel Hade walks up the mountain and glares at the ruins. The next day, the man with glasses claims that it is amazing that there is so much king-grade magic stone. Abel also looks at the stones in awe and claims that this is what powers the barriers. He bets that there are more elsewhere. He says that the assets of the elves of 2,000 years ago are nothing to scoff at. Abel Hade looks at him and intently turns around and starts walking. Abel is impressed that Abel Hade looked at the mountain of treasure and is completely unfazed. Abel Hade stood in front of another door and chanted the spell to open it. The doors open and they follow him as Abel gazes at the huge armors standing on the sides as if guarding the place. He questions if these are the golems. In his answers, Abel Hade just laughs and mutters that he has finally reached this point. And chants fire, shapes fear. Abel quickly pulls out his wand and blocks the attack. The soldiers and others backed away from where they were standing behind Abel. He yells at Abel Hade and asks what he is doing all of a sudden. Abel Hade mutters that it is as expected, that Abel is something special with a sinister grin on his face. He summons a magic circle in his hand. He continues that to be able to cancel his magic formula even among high-level elves there are not any who could do that. The crystal on Golem's head starts to glow. Abel Hade states that the arrows of the god are far too much for the hands of the Norks. The Golem summon behind him and he continues that this is something that belongs to him, a descendant of Zeshem. Abel looks at him in shock. Abel exclaims that he is the descendant of Zeshem. Abel Hade states that Zeshem was driven out by the sky country. The magical powers of the moon barely reach the ground, causing their physical abilities to dwindle particularly their abilities to propagate, meaning they were irrefutably waning in numbers. Abel concludes that this is why their abilities dwindled and this is why he thought he looked older than his actual age. Abel Hade states that he could not give up on his ancestors. In order to oppress the Norks on the ground, they build this stronghold. He announces that all of this is just to make the sky country fall, so that the Zeshem can once again take the throne. Mazen claims that history states that the elves is being prosecuted by the Norks. Maya adds that this is the opposite of the current legend. The elves living in the country are called high-level elves. Abel grasps that the Zeshem that Abel Hade is talking about must be the elves that were forced to descend to the ground 2,000 years ago after the religious conflict. Abel Hade grits his teeth and states that the king made a great error. He became infatuated with the Norks' daughter, and the king who bonded with the Norks spread a barrier over the entire Zeshem stronghold sealing it. He scorns that he mixed their noble blood with the foolish and short-lived Norks. He aggressively exclaims that this is absolutely unforgivable. The kind assassinated his ancestors and shamefully covered up the true history. Maya holds onto Abel's sleeves. Abel Hade states that these golems were created using techniques of the Zeshem to be used as a weapon. He states that with them he has no use for the Lord's soldiers. A soldier calls out to him for scheming against their Lord. Abel accuses that he knew what was inside the ruins which makes the so-called Arrow of God a weapon made to pierce the sky country the most valuable treasure in the world. Abel Hade states that to fire off the arrow he needs a vast quantity of magic stones and the remains of the barriers and all that he has gathered there is enough material for three shots. Abel Hade announces that he will conquer the ground and then gather all the magic stones heaven and earth he will claim them all. The soldiers stagger as they hear him. Abel intently thinks that he gathered that excessive amount of magic stones for this purpose and wonders why he is revealing his plan to them. Abel Hade suddenly asks him to become his right hand man. Abel looks at him in shock as he continues that he is a magician that he acknowledges and if he cooperates with him, he will give Abel half of the world. Maya looks at Abel in worry, but Abel says that he will pretend that he did not hear him. Abel Hade closes his hands muttering that after all this he is just a child. He says that it will be an arduous task to take him head on. Chanting a strong spell he fills the room with black mist. Abel rubs his eyes and calls out to his totem telling it to relocate. He tells Maya, 
and Mazen to get close to the world tree. They attach themselves to him and he tells his puppet to absorb. In a few seconds, the black smoke is gone. He praises Abel but Abel tells him to surrender, however, Abel Hade does not listen as Abel requests again that holding back will be difficult. Mazen tries to stop him but Abel Hade states that he would have surely lost if they were not here. He calls out to the golems and tells them to observe. The golem starts moving toward them and throws a punch Mazen grabs the back of Abel's tunic and runs saving him from the attack. Mazen calls out to him yelling at him to attack but Abel puts his wand in front of him seeming to have grasped something. He tells the golem to obey. Abel Hade frantically asks him how does he know the activation formula. Abel explains that using the knowledge he gained from dissolving the barriers he was able to analyze the golem. He aggressively says that without the magic stones, they will not move but Abel claims that he did it. He tries again saying that the one who does not possess the blood of an elf cannot suppress his commands. Abel makes every one of the golems in the room obey him. Abel Hade shakes frantically in disbelief and yells out a final order before pausing. Abel states that he has taken control of all the golems in this room and determinedly tells Abelhade that it is futile to try and override his barriers on them. Abelhade frantically yells and lashes out throwing a spell at them and running into the ruins as Abel yells at him. 